Thank you, Anna, for organizing this show and for organizing this talk, and welcome to everybody here. You know, I always like to start with a little sort of general um, question, and uh, there are probably several questions one could ask, but, you know, one that always elicits kind of a, sometimes very surprising answers, um, and certainly unique answers, is the question about uh, what makes you an artist, or how did you become an artist? I'm going to start with that question, because I know a little bit of the answer, but not the full answer. Thank you, Scarlett, for being here, and thanks everyone for coming. I grew up in the countryside of Brazil, in a place where art wasn't really talked about as a career path. Um, I didn't know what to be an artist was, but I've I was raised to make my world around me, to use my hands, to play with, you know, the environment, to play with nature. So I remember creating things at, at a very early age. I started painting when I was nine, uh, and I was very serious about it. I even had a show at a local pizzeria, uh, and they displayed all my paintings. It was my first show. <laughs> Um, by the time I was 12, I knew I wanted to be an artist, and I knew that's the path I was going towards. And my first mentor was my grandfather, who was a self-taught artist, uh, painter, sculptor, writer. Um, he died, unfortunately, when, when I was 15, and I had so many questions for him then. But up to that point, he, he's the first person who encouraged me to keep doing, keep pushing, and get out of here, um, which is the beginning of my journey to come to the United States in some ways to pursue art. So that was the beginning of why I'm here now. What, um, what was it about being an artist that like turned you on or, you know, like what was it just that you loved working with your hands or, um, I don't know, you love beautiful things. I mean, what, 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 what were the elements of that? I, th I think for me, desire. it was a way, it was kind of a scape coping mechanism for early in my life. My family is very ritualistic and half of my family is of an indigenous ancestry and the other half is of Soviet, they're Soviet refugees. And the Soviet side is part of a cult um, and I was highly influenced by that cult, although I never belonged to it as a member. Mm. Um, Is it a religious? Yeah, type a religious of cult? Pentecostal cult. Uh -huh. And I, I remember elements of, of having these out of body experiences. So for me, it was very performative. Art was really performative in some ways, and it still is in my work. Um, so I, was, I inherited this constant like, conflict of. Polar uh, polarities in my life. It was like a family who was free and the other who was trapped. So I was in between this, I was the translator of the two. Uh, so art was my way to respond to what was happening. Ithaca, I mean, it's, I think, I don't know about you guys, but I studied Ithaca in high school. I mean, the poem, uh, b both the Homeric, you know, poem, but also the Kavafi, it says, Kavafi. Um, and I have to say, when I studied the, <laughs> these poems, uh, these epic poems, uh, you know, it just seems so apart from me. But um, the odyssey of someone trying to get back home, I could understand better, uh, which is interesting. Um, because I felt that this longing for home is very universal, especially for people who have been uprooted somehow. You know, I came to the United States as a child from Taiwan and was taken away from my home and had to find a new home and this constant adaptation. So what did you find about Ithaca? Was it the uh, Homeric poems that attracted you first? Was it the translation? Because uh, you found this uh, new translation by Emily Wilson, which really upends a lot of you know, the Homer that we were taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a combination of coming across the Odyssey translated by Emily Wilson while taking a class at UCLA during the pandemic. I was 
taking a translation class during the summer. Actually, my teacher is here, is right here. Um, and I learned about her translation and kept reading the book and it felt, it read completely different from what I remembered the book being about and the poem being about. And a journey, the journey in the Odyssey to me is really concerned with like a foreigner being invited into someone's home, which I very much relate to as a foreigner being invited to people's homes, to all these universal themes of what it means to be the human tragedy and the human um, conquest. And when the pandemic happened, I started to create this body of work around the themes of the Odyssey in, in correlation with my own Odyssey as an immigrant and as a woman and as an artist, and what does it mean now to be this person who can't go home because there's a pandemic, or sometimes I can't go home because I'm here financially unable to go home, or I, can't, I couldn't go home for a long time because it was illegal. So I had this, like, all these thoughts in my mind of like, I can't go home. Something is keeping me from going home. So might as well make a home of this journey. So the Odyssey speaks to me in that way. And I took the themes that were to me inspiring. Um, for example, in the, the sculpture in the center, I call her the vessel. I build her for my walks. So I would pick up bamboo and pieces of palm trees and elements in nature that I, where I live, and I would bring it home. I didn't know what I was gonna make with it, but I started building this vessel and that's what it came to be. And I stitched a poem that I wrote onto the body of the vessel. Um, is, is the poem on this th uh, the same as your poem over there? Yeah, it's the poem it, that's so on the you wall. So you, you, you can read um, yeah. Amanda's own interpretation of Ithaca over there. I don't have a copy of it. Can you recite that's it? Okay. Not from memory. OK. <laughs> but she's, she's re reinterpreting it yet yeah. for her own um, uh, journey. Um, and uh, asked whether if Homer had been a woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we know? Yeah, there's that question too, right? Like nobody quite know if it was a male or a female. So it could have been a woman who wrote this poem. And you know, in the Emily Wilson, her translation too, um, she uses language in different ways in, in, in the way that like the male translators obfuscated certain elements of the story to feed the narrative of the time, mm. the, you know, when, it, when they created the narrative, this translation. For example, I think words like slave and slavery. Uh, uh, Roman Greek times was, you know, there were slaves everywhere. And these, the narratives prior to Emily's translation uses the word uh, maid or housekeeper. Oh. <laughs> for slaves. So they're obfuscating this sort of, it, it implies that they're getting paid or implies that they're employees. Mm. And she uses slaves. So she's just like, Much more that's direct. what they are. Right. So our reading of the story is a completely different version of it and just in this one word. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many in there that you know you can point it out to, but that's, that's the power of a translation mm -hmm. through other lens. I think we need narratives to be translated by other perspectives all the time because translations are um, a portal to someone else's world, mm -hmm. to another country's like culture, to someone else's idea of how to be in this world, mm -hmm. and we don't have all perspectives in the moment. You know, right now, mm -hmm. up to this point. Like I was shocked that I'm in America, the readership of translation is only 3% of all published books yeah. in this country. And let alone the translation by women or people of color. Um, so that's even like a much less percentage. So because in the 3%, most of the translations, I think 2% is of Western European. Mm. So the books being written everywhere else in the world are not being read here. Um, what does that say about the culture? What does that say about our perception of, of being in this world and of empathy and accepting one another as foreigners mm -hmm. 
for a country who is who prides itself for being full of like yeah. immigrants yeah yeah um, I mean, I notice as somebody who uh, watches foreign language films, uh, for those of you who speak a different language and you l watch the film it's in, in a, its original language and read the translation, sometimes the translations are way off. Um, you know, I'm, I speak Chinese and sometimes the translation is so bizarre. Um, I know they have to fit it in a certain space, and I think they could have worked a little bit harder to make it more accurate, but you know, some characters are characterized in a bizarre way. Um, but it fits more a stereotype sometimes, you know, what people imagine Chinese people to be saying. Mm -hmm. So, gosh, there's so much, so much to unpack. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I love this Kavafi poem, which I hadn't read in a long time until you brought it up. I mean, I, I think a lot of you have Everybody studied it, right? Just about. Um, I'm just going to read the um, first few lines, mm -hmm. just to remember. He wrote, when you set out for Ithaca, pray that your road's a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. OK, I'm going to murder this word, but lie trigonians, cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be scared of them. You won't find things like that on your way as long as your thoughts are exalted, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lie Trigonians, Cyclops with wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside you, unless your soul raises them up in front of you. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She hasn't anything else to give you. Um, or anything else to give. I just think, you know, when we studied it, it was like introducing us to the idea of the journey being more important than the destination. Um, I mean, I think oftentimes uh, we're raised so goal-oriented, at least as a Chinese person, <laughs> We're raised as very goal oriented. Okay, you're going to go to college, you're going to be a pharmacist, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, you know, we miss out sometimes. I mean, I feel like I was so, when I was in college, I was so determined to get through those four years. I mean, I, now I wish I'd spent a little bit more time enjoying some of the weird things that happened or the, the detours, you know, because that's, that's what happens to Odysseus. The detours are often the, the, the lessons. And all these people you encounter, right? Odyssey, he encounters monsters, witches, goddesses. Some of them guide him towards a goal. Some of them trap him. Mm -hmm. And we all have that in our lives, like of people in our lives that are either motivators of your, you know, of keep going, keep pushing, and others who are traps. Um, when, when you don't know any better. So for me, that also really relates to the trajectory of a, an immigrant. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. an immigrant is so vulnerable to mm. and susceptible to have to be taken afloat into a ride that you, you don't really know. Sometimes I didn't speak the language in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even know what they were telling me mm -hmm. oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you're really blind to this idea of like, what am I supposed to do here? Mm -hmm. Well, you have a certain proficiency with language, I find. I mean, for someone who took up English relatively late, you actually have a lot of, you know, command of, okay. you know, um, phrases. Yeah. And, and I think part of it is that you read a lot. Is I read that, a lot, yeah. Is that? Well, I, I read a lot, because as a kid, well, growing up in Brazil, I don't, most people don't know this, and they're surprised when they hear it, but books are really expensive in Brazil. So I didn't have access to books. I like saved every money I've ever like made as a kid to like buy one book a year uh, because it was like you know fifty reais, which is fifty reais for my family, was luxurious. We didn't buy books, um, and my first book was actually the Odyssey. What? So part of why, yeah, really? the first book I bought and carried with me, and I remember with so much pride, I would carry this giant poem with me around you know around the house and I was reading like through I don't know months at a time but um, yeah I tell the story a little bit in one of uh -huh. yeah one of the the pieces, the pieces but the the Odyssey was the first book I was able to purchase uh -huh. with my own money 
How did you know about it even? I mean, oh, it was famous. I mean, okay. it was one of the books, the classics on the bookshelves. Like of, you know, I would walk into a bookstore, not able to afford it, but I knew I wanted certain books. Mm -hmm. My second book was Cleopatra, a biography of hers. Wow. Because <laughs> I thought, wow, this woman is really cool. Um, but that's, you know, that's what, for me, it was, I didn't know what I was looking for necessarily. I just knew I wanted this particular thing to be in my life, and I didn't know how to get it yet. And then when I moved to America, I, I flipped out that books were so cheap. Yeah. And I also found the public libraries to be an incredible space to be and spend a lot of time at the Boston Public Library <laughs> where I landed first. And I couldn't believe anyone could have access to that. Right. I was you yeah, guys, you know, don't take it for granted. Yeah. When I moved here and found the public library, yeah. I couldn't believe they could let you take books home. Yeah. You know, and like up to 10 at a time sometimes. So yeah. it was a big... I, I don't know. <laughs> so we'll talk about the painting. Yeah. And um, this show, show shows a lot of painting. You're actually, you actually do, um, you do performance, you do uh, installation, sculpture, cut works. But the painting um, is so um, uh, ever-present here. Um, tell me a little bit, so the theme was Ithaca. I think Ithaca itself is the first painting the over there. very first painting, yeah. Um, but let's talk about how you started some of these here. We can start with this one. If you sure. This is one of the first ones of the show. Um, it's called Restless Spirits. And to me, it, it, it's a reference to the spirits of the book and the narrative and the spirits in my life and our lives that guides us, they guide us, invisible, you know, invisible voices, those maybe invisible authors and people who have passed in your life, ancestors, those things that influence you in some ways. That's what this piece was about. Um, I don't know yeah, if, you have if you look closely, there are hands. Uh, I see some feet, mm -hmm. so there. But you don't have a whole figure in there. Yeah. So how do you how do you start start a painting like this, which is fairly intricate? You know, I mean, do you, I know you don't do sketches, right? Is no, that? I don't plan. Mm -hmm. I think my painting is actually really performative. Oh. I see it as performance because for me, when I perform, I feel the same as when I'm painting. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It comes from the same place. Mm -hmm. So I start with just the colors and the background. The lines are the last part. But I start layering the painting until I see something in there that I can work with. I have to be in it for hours at a time to reach a point of almost like timelessness. And um, that's when I know I'm in, in a good place with it. And that's when I know I have to stop or I have to slow down. So do you work on more than one work at a time? Do you focus, like this is quite large it probably took days right of working and yeah this took months months but I did I do work in two to three pieces at a time uh-huh so you start with this background which is sort of a wash a very mm -hmm. light wash I mean different artists work in different ways mm -hmm. and this is sort of mm -hmm. your method tell me a little bit about the one in the middle here and also the relationship with um, uh, the paintings and the cut piece cut pieces okay the middle is called the Cyclops I See. So it's in reference to the Cyclops in the book. The Cyclops in the narrative, in the mythology of it, they see beyond our realm of reality. And I, I like that idea of what is beyond our realm of reality. How can we get to that level of uh, vision? So you were also reading about the mythological mm -hmm. creatures mm -hmm. while you were working on this project? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, the titles of each also come from the, the Odyssey, in right. reference to the Odyssey. Right. So how, how, does, how do you organize your, your energies to mm -hmm. make different, mm -hmm. you know, forms of art? Um, I think I've always done it that way. I've always worked with the resources that I've had in my life, and I... In, in the beginning of making and of my studio practice, I, I worked primarily with found materials because I couldn't afford to buy 
canvas. Mm -hmm. So everything I used was found in trash. Mm -hmm. So the cloth that uh, the cutouts are made from was actually found in a dumpster. I found a huge roll of faux leather in a dumpster uh, by my studio. So I brought it in and I, you know, I didn't know what to do with material until later on it came to me. But so often these materials, like the specimen pieces, which are made from me on my walks, harvesting cotton from a tree, and I bring it into my studio. So I'm harvesting the material before I think about what I'm doing with it. And I have them all around me. So I'm, a, I guess, a hoarder of material, I can say, <laughs> in my studio. But You're not the only one. <laughs> OK. But I, I know I'll do something with it. I just don't. And I know there is a relationship between them. And I love this interaction of, um, again, like this conflict of like different materials speaking a similar mm -hmm. language. Because mm -hmm. to me, the paintings and the cutouts speak a language that is in reference to each other hmm. the lines the cuts they they to me they vibrate together mm -hmm. it's not it's a different medium but it's it belongs with the same body of work and mm -hmm. the idea of of being in that process of thinking about the same narrative so um next week uh, amanda will be doing a performance here so i did mm -hmm. want to ask you a little bit about that mm -hmm. um could you tell us is it about ithaca mm -hmm. is it uh, yeah, the performance and dialogue with the show. I'm using a film footage. It's going to be outside because the screen outside will be showing a film that I recorded doing travels between Brazil and LA. So the, f the whole film is about departure. So I'm, I'm departing places the entire time in the film. Um, so you see me leaving and coming, coming and going. And the performance will happen along with the film. Um, I think we're having a reception, mm. um, yeah. and uh, please feel free to talk to Amanda directly, um, and do look at the, the, the wonderful work we have up here. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.